For a child is born to us and a son is given to us. Words taken from today's introit. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the year 1741 AD, a musician and a composer named George Friedrich Handel was considered a total failure. Nearly bankrupt, obese in body, and filled with both emotional and physical pain, it seemed as if Handel was going to have to pack his bags and return home. Though German, George Friedrich Handel, had come to London, England in the early 1700s in order to achieve fame and much success. But the London elite called him the German nimkumpoop. Handel did not come from a musical family, a musical background. George's father was a practical working German who discouraged his son's musical career at every single turn. He wanted his son to be a lawyer. But George would not be dissuaded from pursuing his love of music. And when he came to London, Handel decided to give opera a chance. But this particular musical form had sort of lost his popularity, at least in England. And then when he put his first opera on, he found that hardly anyone came to the event. As he said to his friends after an empty house at his first showing, Handel joked, an empty venue would mean for good acoustics. Despite his good humor, the good composer was in a desperate situation financially. Deeply depressed, George Friedrich Handel was visited by a very wealthy friend who had written out a special set of biblical texts that were connected with Christ our Lord and Savior. The rich man hoped to put these texts to music in order to challenge various deists and skeptics who had denied the divinity of our dearest Lord. He then turned to Handel and asked if he would be willing to compose the music for the piece. Assured of being very well compensated, Handel answered that he would, and he estimated its completion within a year's time. Handel began composing music for these biblical texts on August 22nd, 1741. And within six days, part one was fi finished. Within the next few days, part two was finished. And in nine more days after that, part three was finished and done. It took him only an additional two days to finish the orchestration. Handel composed like a man possessed. He rarely left his room and rarely touched his meals. But within 24 days, he had composed 260 pages of music, an immense physical feat. Handel had composed one of the most famous oratorios in history, simply called The Messiah. And when he finished writing it, he, especially at the Alleluia Chorus at the end, Handel said, quote, I did think I did see heaven before me and the great God himself, unquote. After his success with the Messiah, he never composed another Italian-style opera again. His orchestral work, known as the water music, and also music for the royal fireworks, would follow and will remain, even to this day, very, very popular. Many have said that Handel was not only a great composer, but that he was a dramatic genius of the first order. His music exerted a strong influence in both the classical and romantic composers, especially Mozart and Beethoven. Almost blind towards the end, he died in 1759, a very respected and a very wealthy man. He actually died on Holy Saturday, the day before Easter. And before he died, Handel stated that, quote, he hoped to meet his good God, his sweet Lord and Savior, on the day of his resurrection. A close friend remarked that Handel, died a good Christian with a true sense of his duty to God and to man and in perfect charity with all. Handel was redeemed, it seemed, by the Messiah in more than just one way. Handel's Messiah is divided into three parts, almost as if it were the Holy Rosary put to music, with part one focused on the joyful prophecies and the fulfillment with the virgin birth, while parts two and three are focused in on the passion, death, and resurrection, and yes, glorification of the Son of God and Son of Mary. 
Although Handel's Messiah originally premiered in the Easter season, it has become especially connected with Advent and Christmas. This is perhaps due to the artistic beauty of part one of the oratorio, the music provided for the biblical text, especially from Isaiah chapter 9. That joyful and vibrant phrase, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. At this point in that oratorio, the entire choir is involved, beginning with the sopranos, then followed by the tenors and the baritones. And there are layers and waves of song in which that biblical verse is repeated multiple, multiple times. It is really one of the great highlights of a performance that can literally last more than two and a half hours in length. But in the midst of all the beauty of that music, one of the greatest pieces of all time, one might overlook the actual significance of that verse, in particular that line, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Who is this child? It can only be the Messiah himself, Christ, the Son of God and Son of Mary. And who is giving him to us? It is the Heavenly Father as well as the Blessed Mother. Again, consider what is being said here. The gravity of it. The Christ child, the divine infant, has been given to us. The Son of God and Son of Mary is a gift given to us, a gift that we possess for our use. And although we are infinitely unworthy, this is a gift that we can use to our own benefit. When you look at a traditional painting or icon of Our Lady holding the divine infant, it usually shows her looking directly at the viewer and not at her divine son. In fact, traditionally in those icons, both mother and son are traditionally focused on you, the viewer, not on each other. They hardly ever look at each other. The message is clear. The mother of God does not have an exclusive possession of the Lord, her Savior. She is detached from pure motherly affection, for she knows that this child is a gift to all a victim for all. The Christ child then is yours and he's mine. His father gave him to us. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that all who believe in him might not perish but might have eternal life. The son of God and son of Mary gives himself fully to me and you every day as our priest and victim upon the altar of sacrifice. He is our living bread from heaven that we can literally, literally consume. And the whole Christ has been given to you and to me, including the gift of his mystical body, the Catholic Church. Holy Church, therefore, is ours. Her saving sacraments, all her angels, her wondrous apostles, her martyrs, her confessors of the one true faith all her virgins, all her holy men and women, the entire treasury, the entire deposit, all the merits of Christ, all the merits of Our Lady, all the merits of all the saints we have access to. All that belongs to the church is ours for our use. The riches of the mystical body of Christ are available to us. Again, the gravity of those words, for unto us a child is given, unto us a son is given. I can now offer the Heavenly Father the heart of Christ. Poor prayers that I have, I can offer him infinite worship because I have Christ as my gift. I can offer the first person of the most blessed Trinity all the love that Christ the child has for the Father for it's mine to offer. I love the Father with the love of the Christ child. I can love the Father literally with the heart of Christ. I can offer the Father the tears shed by the divine infant while he was in the manger. 
I can offer all the discomfort the Christ child felt in the cold cave as an infinite act of reparation. You and I also have access to the heart of Our Lady to love God with. We can love God with the heart of the Blessed Mother. We can love with the two hearts, the Sacred Heart of our Lord and the Immaculate Heart of Mary are the two hearts that we can use to love and worship God with. Consider, for example, what St. John wrote in one of his letters. He writes, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. He's our victim. Furthermore, think about all the devotional prayers that we recite. The prayers, for example, to the most precious blood. Look at what they say. Eternal Father, I offer thee the merits of the most precious blood of Jesus. I can offer them to the Father. They're mine. They're yours. For the holy souls in purgatory, I can pray using the blood of Christ. I can pray for the repentance of the unbelievers. I can pray for the extirpation of all heresies and false teachings. And I can pray for the conversion of all sinners. And my prayers will work because I have the blood of Christ to offer. And yes, another prayer to the precious blood. Eternal Father, I offer thee the merits of the most precious blood of Jesus first shed at the circumcision, which I have access to for all my relations, all my friends and enemies, for the poor, the sick, and those in tribulation. I can offer the omnipotent God all the infinite merits of Christ, all the merits of the Blessed Mother, all the merits of all the saints. I can offer him all the blood of the martyrs, all the purity of the virgins, all the penances of all the holy desert fathers of old. I can offer this and all to the good Lord, for all these things are mine and they are yours. The divine infant, the little child is born for us. That's why he came, for us. The divine infant is born for us. The Messiah has been given to us. So let us use this Christmas gift well, so that we may gain the gift one day of eternal life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.